welcome to Streamers and Punches, the podcast from Sound Notion TV that looks at current events and new releases in the world of film music. My name is Bill Witham. And I'm Kevin Wilt. And on today's episode, we're going to look at current events. Uh, we're going to look at some CDs that have just come out, what Kevin and I have been listening to, and we're going to also speak about some upcoming films and what we're looking forward to in the next few months. So without further ado, I want to actually say that, not that I called this or anything, but last episode, I did ask Kevin... Kevin, you can back me up on this. That's right. That I was concerned, as far as a composer can be concerned, about what is Hans Zimmer's approach going to be to write the music of Batman, because most likely it's Hans Zimmer who's going to be scoring the second Superman movie, which will have Batman in it. But it's not going to be Christian Bale's Batman, even though Hans Zimmer was the composer on that series of movies and the Superman movie, and he's going to be scoring Superman versus Batman. So he's going to have to come up with new Batman music, in other words. Because he can't make it sound identical, because then we'll be reminded of Christian Bale, and we're not supposed to be reminded, because it will be Ben Affleck right. as Batman. So, as soon as I mused that thought, in, and we, uh, we recorded it, I don't even think it was a couple days after, and I saw an interview where Hans Zimmer did mention, or was asked about that very thing. So, we'll have a link to that on our site, because he simply said, it's complicated, but... Did hint at least that's what I got out of it, Kevin. Didn't you? That he would Pretty have much, some. Yeah, that he, I mean, he certainly didn't say no. I'm not going to do it, but he acknowledged that. Yeah, it's going to be a tricky, tricky situation because he he worked really hard to make the Superman scores be very very different than his Dark Knight score, and now he you know does he have to go back? Does he have to go back, but kind of in a different direction? It's it's a tricky thing. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. But um, I, I certainly I would be surprised, even though it's a it's a it's a tricky situation. I would I would be very surprised if he didn't score the movie. Yeah, so, I kind of think, I think it's him, and I think he'll probably come up with something new. But how new? We'll see. Because there was a recent video you even shared with me where it shows Hans Zimmer working with the steel string. Yeah, uh, the steel string guitars. Yeah, and, and these are all guitars that essentially lay on the table in front of you, and you play it almost like a... Um, lap oh, steel. Um, um, so it's, a, it's a lap steel guitar. It's, it's, it's almost like you can, yeah. it looks like you're playing like a dulcimer or a zither what, kind of um, funky kind of thing. But it's, a dobro? A, yeah. a dobro works that way as well? Um, it is a dobro. A dobro is a nickname for this thing. Yeah, yeah. dobro is a brand, isn't it? I think, maybe? Well, I didn't Clearly, we're experts in the matter. Yeah, because yeah, because we know what the hell we're talking about. <laughs> well, um, when when Hans Zimmer was uh, uh, working with all those musicians, he's sort of on camera saying, "I just want to make sure this score sounds completely different than any of the Batman music." Right. And I thought, well, I don't know that it sounded. In the end, it was really still heavily percussive and was very moody and very atmospheric, but had a little bit of a piano idea that kind of came in and out. So I thought, I don't know if he achieved a completely... Oh, thank you, Dave. And there's our producer, Dave McDonald, most recently a recipient of the Innovation Award in Music... What the hell is it called? Music it's Scholarship. A, it's a props award for academic innovation at Full Sail University. All right, Go I think me. we need a screenshot of the airplane. Yeah, can we, can we see the award in question? There we go. Bam. All right, congratulations. To our producer. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I'm doing all day now. So now, according to your Wikipedia search uh, on Dobro, we are incredibly wrong. Is that what it's looking like? It, it is. It is indeed a registered trademark of the Gibson Guitar Corporation. So I was about that. For, I was used for us a, a resonator guitar, which yeah. is what so you're it talking is a brand about. Name for a completely different thing than what we were talking about. But I was right about that. Okay. Okay. See, I like it when our episodes are more stream of consciousness. I mean, I think schedules are overrated, so I like we can pause and, and, and entertain a tangent. It's not like our schedules are really that well prepared anyway. So. <laughs> well, I was now that we're in the mood for congratulations, so uh, Hans Zimmer, not only did our very own producer win something, so congratulations to Dave, Hans Zimmer was named Composer of the Year by Classical Brits, so congratulations Hans Zimmer, but that is only the beginning. S&P listeners, oh yes, because right after his appearance on our show, Bear McCray won an Emmy. 
and it was right. awesome. And it was all because of, well, his awesomeness. It has nothing to do with our show, but we want to think that it does, and we're going to connect him we'll to call our that show. The streamers of Punches Bump. That's the SAP bump. And we're going to connect into this show as much as humanly possible. I don't think so. it's a stretch to say that he won an Emmy because he was on our show immediately before the ceremony. I don't think, I think that's the, a stretch. I think the Emmy it's committee not. was like, who out there talks to the people right. and really stays connected to middle and America? One choice, and that was us. Right. Well, I was going to say, they said Barry McCray talks to middle America oh. via streamers and punches. No, so. no, it's we talk to the important people. So they went and asked, okay, who do... Who do Bill and Kevin talk to? Let's give that person the Emmy. It's well, just for it just it, you know it's too bad for Michael Price that we talked to Barry McCurry after we talked to him because then maybe we'd be talking about Michael Price winning an Emmy. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. well maybe next year. Maybe if you know freaking sure, Sherlock season, season three would be awesome. I'm certain of it. Anyway, yeah. Speaking Whenever of Brits out, and music and you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, I did find it interesting, and we, we'll have a link to this article up on our website, of course, um, soundnotion.tv slash SAP, about Hans Zimmer winning this Classical Brit Award. Uh, he beat out Arvo Pert, which I think is interesting. Um, this, this is not an award specifically for film music. Um, this is just composer of the year, interpret it how you want. Um, so, I don't know. That's kind of interesting. Um, also, is, Luciano yeah. Pavarotti won an award, even though he's been dead for quite some time. But, that shows you how, um, yeah, these awards are really picked before, you know. Yeah, they already know who's going to win. Yeah. And maybe anyway. I'm being sarcastic, but still. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Actually, the um, next article we have is actually kind of interesting. Um, it's another, kind of like Bear McCreary. This one, we have sort of an indirect connection to, I suppose. And that is- uh, we, we've got an article here uh, about um, uh, f- uh, the female orchestrators and how how um, how rare it is that the lead orchestrator on a film is is, is a female. And so this uh, uh, the author of this article kind of poses this question of, of why is it that female orchestrators, um, meaning the lead orchestrator of a film, are is, is such a rare thing. Uh, and one of the examples uh, they give is uh, composer Penka Kuneva, I'm butchering the last name, I apologize, uh, who was the lead orchestrator on the recent Matt Damon movie, Elysium. Um, but she is the wife of Daniel Schweiger, who was someone that we had on our show not a terribly long time ago. So it, it's an interesting article because it mentions that you know there are, there are a handful of, of female film composers out there, like Rachel Portman, um, Certainly not many, but but there are, are are some. But the the number of female lead orchestrators is much much closer to zero, which is kind of a strange strange thing. So it's an interesting article to take a look at, and again, we'll have that link for you up on our site as well. Cool. Um, also, one more shout out uh, to Bear, but uh, he as he likes to point out on Facebook that he studied with Elmer Bernstein. While he was working on his um, education, you say he, he, you say that like he was name dropping all the time on Facebook. I don't think that that's not what this is. <laughs> well, no, no, it's just that name drop anymore. when he studied with uh, Elmer, if I may call him that, sure. <laughs> he took down many really cool quotes and sort of saved them. And then occasionally on Facebook, he'll issue like a quote of the day from Elmer Bernstein as it relates to scoring or just working in the movie industry. And they're somewhat entertaining, but always enlightening. So uh, there's a blog post that we have a link to on our site, and uh, it'll list all the favorite quotes from... Yeah, and and, and from I, I really like the quotes within the, the context of his blog post, because he's a fairly experienced composer now, having just won an Emmy after being on our show. Um, he, he'll, he'll list a quote, and then he'll say, okay, you know, I've, I've found this one to be true um, for this, this, and this. Or... I haven't found this one to be true, but maybe I just haven't run into it yet. Um, so he, he gives like a, a lot of nice context to these quotes as well, which I think is, is, is really kind of neat. So, yeah, go, uh, to Bear's, go to Bear's blog, check out the, the list of quotes, read it. Yeah. It's interesting. So uh, how does binge watching change things for TV composers, Kevin? It's an excellent question, Bill. We have uh, uh, an article um, – just from Reuters that's been kind of floating around to a lot of different places that asked that question is, is now that people binge watch TV 
and they're not, it's not a week or a month between episodes, how does that change what the composer can or, or, or should do? And it's, it's a really interesting uh, question, I think. It reminded me immediately, going way back to when we first started our show, which today is episode 50, by the way. So congratulations, Bill, for 50 episodes of Streamers and Punches. Congratulations to you too, Kevin. Thanks, sir. Um, but going way back to when we first started the show, our first interview was Bruce Broughton, um, which was still, I think, still one of our coolest interviews because he was fantastic and he's a great composer. And Anyway, um, he had mentioned scoring episodes of Dallas in the early 80s. And he would get, I forget how many players he said he got, maybe like a dozen or something. So he would get a certain number of musicians each episode. And uh, I, I think, I, I don't remember the exact circumstances, but it would very often, it would be a different group of musicians, a different group of instruments for each episode. Um, somewhat for, for maybe just for variety's sake, that you know, one episode may be strings, another episode might be a lot of you know, low reedy instruments or something like that. And so he could, he could kind of change up the ensemble for each episode. And I think that's one of the things that with binge watching, is maybe a little bit less flexible because if I'm watching a half an hour or an hour, hour of TV and then immediately watching the next episode and the, the sound palette of the episode has changed that much, I think it's probably more jarring when you watch them back to back as opposed to when they're a week apart. Huh. That's an interesting concept or idea. I'm, do you think it would really matter that much? Do you think I it's know, breaking maybe, bad? Maybe not. maybe not. It was just a thought I had because... Mm-hmm. I, I wonder if that's something you can get away with more when the episodes are a week apart and not back to back. Um, and, and, you know, the article also mentions ideas about, um, you know, re- recurring themes as if you've got a show, again, if you have a show where you're watching an episode one week to the next, as opposed to watching them back to back, if you're watching a show back to back and you're using some main thematic idea a lot, it's entirely possible that your audience is going to get sick of it a lot faster. And even before the show, when we were talking about this, Dave, our producer, mentioned when you're binge watching a show, how annoying the main title theme can get because you're having to sit through it every single time. Um, and so a lot of times you just want to fast forward to it. And I think that that can maybe apply to the underscore as well as if a composer is using a main theme a lot, um, if you're binge watching a show, can that get tiring? I think a great counter example to that is Breaking Bad. This, the, of course, had the series finale just a few days ago. And it was awesome. Before that, no which spoilers. Is, no, well, okay, so I'll, I'll avoid spoilers, even though you can all go watch the show right now. Um, I shouldn't have to avoid spoilers, <laughs> but I will anyway, just to be courteous. The second to last episode, um, <laughs> which was I think I think they said there were like 62 total episodes. So the second to last mm-hmm. episode, um, there's a great moment at the end of the episode when I guess you could argue that the main character sort of um, comes into full bloom as, his, as, as this personality that he's sort of been developing. He, he sort of comes to realization of who he, he is, I, I suppose is a way of saying it. Um, that Dave Porter, the composer for Breaking Bad, for the first time, as, as far as I can recall, for the first time in those 61 episodes, finally uses the main title music as underscore. And it really, really um, works well in that moment because he's avoided it for so long. And, and I think that sort of scoring strategy, if you will, is what this article is about, that these things, now that people are watching these episodes back-to-back, composers have to make, pay more attention to these longer arcs because it's now such condensed viewing. Yeah, that was a great moment. Um, now I'm not going to talk about what happened in it, but yeah, musically, I remember specifically hearing not just the main title music, but it's a really interesting combination of guitar and then some sort of sampled instruments, and it's got sort of this really dirty grunge kind of like yeah, bar guitar band kind of sound. I don't know, but the yeah, thing I, think, is, I think Dave Porter should going. show Hans Zimmer how to use steel guitars in his. Well, court. it kept it, it right. kept going though. It was it's like he lengthened it in a way that didn't sound like, oh, now that's the main title. Oh wait, right. he's just adding more and adding more and add. No, it sounded like this is what the entire 
thing is supposed to actually sound like. Yes. And then they just clipped out like five seconds of it for the opening. And that's all we've gotten for five years. And then this one key moment, it's like now you get the actual whole thing. It was very cool. And also just, yeah, congrats to Dave Porter on, on a good composing job and a good run on a great show. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and they, I think the show ended at the perfect time. And now we can um, all go. Now, sadly, up. we have to move on, and we don't have it to watch this Sunday. But that's okay. And I feel sorry for that new A and E sh- or A sorry AMC show, Low Winter Sun, because that thing has gotten nothing but hate in the meantime. Yeah, because every- <laughs> it's the punchline. It's the go-to punchline now. Like with Breaking Bad being gone, what the hell are we going to do? Watch Low Winter Sun? Well, I mean, that's. I mean, you know, what are you going to do when you have to follow the Rolling Stones? I mean, you're screwed. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, pretty much. You know? Um, anyway. <laughs> yeah. So we've got uh, another interview that was yeah. on uh, WQXR, a radio station in New York. Uh, it's an interview with Alec Baldwin about um, – it's called Alec Baldwin on why music makes the film. Now, Alec Baldwin has a fairly ongoing relationship with the New York Philharmonic. Uh, he, he donates They've a lot of seen each that. other for a few years now. That's, and that's it's right. It's getting serious. Getting, it's getting pretty serious. Um he donates quite a bit to them, I, I think. Um, he does. Uh, um, he does the PBS na- yeah, announcement. When, when they have PBS specials, he's mm-hmm. like the host and narrator and things yeah. like that. He also, I think, does uh, does a lot. I, I don't know if he's got a regularly occurring radio show on like the local, on maybe QXR um, about classical music, but he's um, fairly connected to the orchestra. Yeah. Uh, and they recently did a concert, which I've heard really great things about. Um, it was a, a, a live film music concert um, with the music director. Um, Alan Gilbert. Alan Gilbert, which is very, it's not very often that you see the music director of a major orchestra doing um, a film music concert, but this was not necessarily a typical Pops concert either. They played um, the, the score of 2001 A Space Odyssey to, to picture live. Um, and it, that, of course, includes, you know, Sprouse... Um, all those Sprox. Also, all those Sprox Zarathustra includes, mm-hmm. um, was it, well, I think, well, the, 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 Atmospheres, I think, is one of the pieces. Um, Johann the, Strauss, the, the, waltz, uh, yeah. the Blue Danube Waltz, you know. Um, and so I guess, the, the, so there's this live music with picture of the live score, but there, there's also, um, I guess, a... Um, Oh, I forget the person's name, and I forget exactly what the field was, but somebody kind of talked before the concert or, or, or something involved with the concert of, like, the effect on of, of how how music affects our viewing of the, the, the film, like, at a neurological level. Um, so just the project in general sounded like a very interesting experience, sounded like a great concert, but there's also this interview of, from Alec Al Baldwin talking about film music that I think is worth listening to as well, so you can find that link on our webpage. Um, cool. It, it's also been announced. I, I, you know, I honestly, I can't remember if, if we, if this was something we talked about before, or maybe we just kind of assumed, uh, but that Michael Giacchino was hired to score Tomorrowland, which is, um, Brad Bird's next movie, Brad Bird. They, they work together, of course, on the Incredibles on, um, Mission Impossible Mission four. Impossible. Mm-hmm. So it's, I think that's one that's kind of to be expected, but it's official now. Anyway, <laughs> Well, we just shifted from film scoring to Blair Witch Project. Sorry. There we go. Don't worry, Kevin. Technical we'll hand over to Bill until your technical Fine. difficulties are corrected. All right. Yay, Tomorrowland. May- yes. Maybe if I mention Tomorrowland, will the lights go out in my apartment? No, they Hopefully won't. Hopefully not. That's just, that's just my office being fun. We'll have a power surge. Um, so anyway. cool. Yeah. Good job for G. Kino. Got a nice gig. And not just that, but he's got a good collab- collaboration going on with Brad Bird. And Brad Bird... Yeah. Does okay. not play around and makes good, solid movies. It's, yeah. They're entertaining, but they're they're like well. Yeah, I, I still might argue that. Well, I, maybe Up is in contention, but The Incredibles might is is, is certainly in contention for my favorite Pixar uh, Michael Giacchino scores. Uh, I think it's one of the top Pixar films. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. So it's, yeah, looking forward to this one. So yeah, yeah. cool. Um, my I want to say my friend David Chen, but we don't know each other personally. But uh, David Chen of Slash Film, who runs his own podcasts, uh, recently made one where he interviewed Rob Simonson, who's the composer on uh, an independent film called The Spectacular Now. And it's a great sort of extended conversation where it's, it doesn't uh, 
it, it doesn't get ultra, ultra in-depth um, on any level, say, music theory or anything like that. But, but he definitely he plays a few cues and gets input from the composer about, so how did you arrive at this music? But the music was really cool, and it brought my attention to an independent film that I don't, that I was not aware of, that has been getting some good critical reviews. So I will, in turn, bring the attention to all of our listeners that um, I do plan to check it out at some point. The Spectacular Now seemed like a pretty well done, uh, sort of a young adult drama, coming of age story, seemed to be well handled with some, I don't want to say twists, but but like good storytelling that is not necessarily uh, rote or, or um, uh, cliche. And then the scoring seemed to also be noticeable. And when he played the music, it had a very distinct personality, was in- very colorful, very interesting. And some of it, he had said they wanted to just sound like a drunk marching band in one cue. And when they played the music, it sounded like a drunk marching band. So it was kind of, well, sort of. They could play together, though. But the notes and the rhythms were, were a lot of fun. It was very colorful. And in this age of very processed, very um, manipulated studio sounding scores, and I'm thinking of our top big budget films and yeah. How the, the music seems very uh, kind of, well, you, you've heard it before. You've heard bits and pieces from another film, and they're just going to be kind of reassembled in this big film. This uh, music that, that David Chen looked at with the composer was very refreshing and very unique and not like anything you, you would hear in Star Trek Into Darkness or, or Iron Man 3 or Man of Steel or anything like that. So very cool, and I've got the link, and we'll post it at soundnotion.tv slash SAP for anyone who's interested. Uh, and then, Kevin, you found an article, a good article with Howard Shore. A little talk yeah, chat with him. It's, it's, it's an interesting article. Apparently, uh, and it's from a very, it's from the Slotsburg Village is the name of the paper that its article is in. So, um, you know, a, 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 a small publication, but it's an article about um, a talk that Howard Shore gave uh, just at, like a church down the road from where he was living. I mean, it, not a big, huge formal thing. Um, it's just kind of interesting. You get a little bit of insight into Howard Shore's working process, which which is a topic in general I find very fascinating. I've, I've not only with composers but with with authors, just about um, kind of daily working routines and 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 how they they do what it is they do, um, which I find is an interesting topic. And the the article goes on to talk about how um, he doesn't like music notation programs. He likes writing um, by hand. Which, mm-hmm. which I find interesting. I, th- I think when I hear someone say that, I, I think that there's always maybe a little bit of romanticism involved. Um, but at the same time, I also there, there are days when I wish that I wrote more by hand and less in notation programs. Um, the, the author also goes on to compare Howard Shore to um, Franz Josef Haydn, which was an interesting comparison. But the comparison basically was... Does that uh, make Peter Jackson Prince Esterhazy? <laughs> that's right. He's, okay. He probably has as much money as the Esterhazy family. Um, I mean, he owns all of New Zealand by this point, right? He has a castle, right? I'm, I'm assuming he does. Also, so assuming he just bought New Zealand. So that that, him, that would make that would said, "Hey, I'm, I'm, can I offer you?" Imagine how that would Tolkien, make Zimmer his manservant. <laughs> imagine how the Tolkien estate must feel. It's like you totally used our material to get more money than we currently have, probably. Or, yeah, probably. I'm sure the Tolkens knows. are doing fine now. Uh, yeah, but it's interesting because the comparison was, and, and Haydn is an interesting figure because of this in general, because Haydn was not a Mozart child prodigy. Haydn was a guy who was largely a crappy composer until he was like 40, because he just had to practice and get good at it, um, which I think is sort of a nice story for the rest of us to hear that <laughs> if we're not geniuses by the time we turn 12, it's okay. Somebody else made it work. Um, but th- that was the comparison, is that Howard Shore, like Haydn, was somebody who really didn't hit his stride until later in life. And I think, I think you can make the argument that that's where Howard Short's coming from, too. I mean, hmm. when all's said and done, you look back on Howard Short's career, what movies will you be talking about? Well, yeah, there's The Fly and there's Silence of the Lambs, but you're probably going to be talking about the Lord of the Rings movies, which he didn't do until a little later, you know. I thought it was an interesting comparison. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, yeah. put that, we'll put the article from the... Um, you know, the, the media conglomerate that is the slotesburgvillage.com website. Uh, we'll put that up on our website. It's a, it's a really cool article to check out. I'm glad we found it. Um, so, yeah, there you go. Okay. So, um, 
What's that, Kevin? What have I been listening to this week? Oh, yes. Oh, I'm, Bill, I'm glad you asked. To lately. I'm sorry. You guys, How you know, after for... after having done this, you know, 49 times before, I think you guys are getting really good at it. I'm oh, just, thanks. This conversation is really flowing for me. Yeah. I mean, segues are our specialty. Yeah, we, sure. I mean, I don't want to keep you guys from, from the thing. I'm totally blowing yeah. your uh, your mojo. Yeah, because that, that segue was so smooth, and now it just got disrupted. Because someone had to win an award, and now anyway. Okay, uh, so I did. I, I picked up a few of the CDs that I talked about a couple episodes back. The uh, Wyatt Earp is really great. Uh, it actually sounds okay. So first of all, let me just re-explain the James Newton Howard score from 1994 for Wyatt Earp is re-released on a three-disc uh, set. It's actually, there you go. Right there. Yeah. There you go. I'm to get it in the corner. Something like that. Anyway, so uh, it's very nice. The sound is is really good. Uh, and it almost sounds like a lot of the cues, because they're like the longer, more expanded cues, are even just a touch, a touch slower. Or I don't, maybe I'm hearing things, but it's great. And man, I just love, I just love that Wyatt Earp tune. And oh, you, it's so good. If you love it, you'll hear a lot more of it, which is great. I one thing I've always felt was that the original album release that I got, you know, back when I was in college, has you know a kind of you know, a layout to it that's sort of chrono- chronological to the story, but um, is also done kind of like where it has musical peaks and valleys. So a slow cue is followed by a fast cue, a very exciting one's followed by a very pastoral one. But um, I always noticed that about two thirds of the way through that album, it seemed to kind of peter out a little bit and pick up a little bit near the end, but not able to keep. And this is now keep in mind, this is a completely separate complaint then did James Newton Howard actually write a good score to the film or not? This is just me maybe being a, a little bitch when I listen to the CD. <laughs> but with this one, it goes for much longer and sustain. I thought it sustained musical interest much longer, ironically, by including the entire film score. And so you hear much more sort of variations on the theme and different orchestrational changes, and it's just really nice. So, so this, this is a case of, of more is more, kind of? Yeah, more is better in this case. And then they have all these alternate cues. And then because James Newton Howard incorporates technology quite a bit with his music, including doing a MIDI mock-up of a lot of his cues, which if you ever got The Fugitive, the expanded, you see um, the MIDI cues and then you hear the or the, the one that re- is recorded with the orchestra. So at the end of that one, just like with Wyatt Earp, at the end of the album, they save and they put his original MIDI synth mock-ups so you can actually hear, like, this is what he came up with and how he had, you know, so the strings are here, the trombones will be there, and the percussion are going to play this. And so you hear, like, a very bad-sounding rendition. But clearly he had it worked out well in advance, and then, well, well in advance, and then they just orchestrated it and then got the musicians to sight-read it, and it was just fantastic. So I, I consider it a, a purchase that is very worthy. And uh, there was a, a slew of Goldsmith things that have been released, uh, Poltergeist 2, and um, Star Trek Insurrection has an expanded version, and those are, those are good. I haven't actually made it all the way through Poltergeist. It's quite a bit more electronic than the original score, which is, like, perfect to me. Uh, and then Insurrection is, uh, does actually, I think, benefit also from the extra music included back in it. And then just for comparison's sake, I watched the movie Star Trek Nemesis, because all these J.J. Abrams Star Trek movies have kind of made me miss the uh, Next Generation crew. And so I w- went back and watched their last few movies. And, um, and I enjoyed the, the, the Nemesis score is Goldsmith. That's like right, right before he passed away. Yeah. And so it's a nice, in some ways it subverts what you would expect from a Star Trek movie score. Because they try to do some new things in the film itself. And they weren't entirely successful, especially not, not with fans of Star Trek. But the score does have great things, has great ideas that he brought to that one, and it has great motives and ideas that he's already composed for previous films that he brought back. And so the darker tone of the film is matched in his uh, darker score. Mm-hmm. So, Kevin, what have you been listening to lately? Uh, most re- the, the film I've seen most recently was actually, uh, it's, a, it's a smaller film. I, I guess it's small enough that you'd call it an indie film. Uh, in a World, it was written, directed, and starring Lake Bell. Um, it's, 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 you know, like hour and a half comedy. And it's about, um, 
the the movie trailer voiceover industry, we, and it's it's pretty funny. It's got score music by Ryan Miller, um, which you know serves the film well enough. It, it it kind of does what you expect music in an indie film to do, which is it, it's there when it needs to be for transitions and things. Um, it's not a big expensive orchestra thing, which which would be inappropriate for a film like this. Um, it's, it's, you know, a good score, funny film, worth checking out. Not a whole lot to say about the music, but in, in some ways I think that can be a good thing in a case like this. Um, if there were a lot of music to talk about, then I don't, it probably wouldn't have worked very well in this film. Mm-hmm. Like, I guess, so I guess the real music of this film is all the dulcet tones of all the voiceover people. I suppose that's really where the music comes into play. <laughs> Well said. I, I'm, I'm imagining they spoof the, you know, inner world. Oh, it, inner it's, world. It's all yeah. about the inner world. I mean, yeah, yeah. It's all about the inner world. Absolutely. And it's very funny. It's very funny how they handle it. Yeah. Uh, also, just to point out a couple CD releases that are worthwhile. Um, the uh, True Grit, which is the original with John Wayne, that's got an Elmer Bernstein score that is available for purchase. There is a four CD set of X Files. Of course, by Mark Snow, who composed for the entire run of the show. The film with four witches, or I think one of them, Sarah Jessica Parker, uh, Hocus Pocus, uh, with a score by John Debney, that's available. And I think that's out now for the first time ever. That one, I think, is kind of interesting because. Yeah, well, I I, I remember. I got one more. I got one more. All right, and then Justice League uh, Flashpoint Paradox with a score by uh, Friedrich Wiedemann, or. Weidman or Weidman, I'm not actually sure how he's pronouncing it these days. This is the guy who also wrote the music to the Green Lantern animated show that we mentioned a few episodes back. That is out and available. Kevin, go. Okay. Uh, you're, you're good? You feel better? I can, I can interrupt you now? I'm done. Yes. <laughs> you're not going to interrupt my interruption? Um, huh? Yeah. No, the, the, what? the John, the John Debney score to Hocus Pocus. Huh? I, yeah, okay. Um, John Debney scored a Hocus Pocus. I, you know, I, I, I remember the movie. I remember watching the movie a lot as a kid. I don't remember the score quite as much, but I, I, I have sort of developed this feeling that these types of movies, these kind, they're kind of more not necessarily just kid movies, but movies that are a little bit, I guess, a little bit more innocent, a little bit more childlike, are tend to be where John Debney, De, Debney scores. I think work better. Um, you know, his, his score to Iron Man two, for example, it, it, that that really didn't do a whole lot to, for me. But I really like his score to Elf. I thought that was really nice. And I, I guess his for me, the scores of his that stick out tend to be more for that type of movie. Movie. So it would be interesting, at least for me, to see where his score to Hocus Pocus kind of d- does it support that or or, or not. Mm, okay. That'd be worth checking out then. I mean, I'm not sure if you had similar reactions to John Debbie's no. films, but that, that's kind of where I say which John Debbie's. Um, You know, I, I don't follow a lot of his stuff. I, I listen. I gave him a shot. Um, I guess this is the portion of Bill's rant or rambling is what we've arrived at. No, I was just going to say that uh, nothing against him personally, of course, but I've listened to some of his scores, and I always kind of just felt a little bit of uh, – well, I can clearly hear – that he's just got James Horner going on here or a kind of a, a large bombastic, here's my take on John Williams here or a Goldsmith approach here or something like that. And it never felt like where's, you know, where's John Debney in all of this. So it felt like even though we're in the Hollywood industry, which is where all this music's produced, all the other artists or other composers, even Danny Elfman and even to some degree Hans Zimmer, they do have a clear, distinct fingerprint in their music and with um debney i've always had a hard time identifying it because i I keep hearing everyone else so it's sort of like a pastiche sound of 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 everyone else but and so that's you know so i actually don't notice his scores to smaller stuff and some sometimes because i haven't seen them but um or some of it seems to be sort of forgettable but uh elf is a successful film i've seen the film and i liked it and i enjoyed it and I didn't come away remembering the music, but that usually means because it blended in so well that it was just right there. Yeah, so like like I said, with Inner World, sometimes yeah, sometimes that's that's how you want it to be. You know, Inner World, you won't hear my music. Yeah, uh, yeah, and of course, uh, the one I do like that is bombastic is the Cut Third Island, and that's right when Debney started, and it's got a tune that's been played in movie trailers ever since. 
but um but it's very clear there's like Horner and there's Gustav Holst and then there's of course like Corn Gold and a John Williams kind of large brassy Star Wars sound, mm-hmm. which is also a Corn Gold sound, and that's kind of throughout the entire score. It's a pirate film, so it was always enjoyable, and it kind of uh, it was kind of the only one I ever really enjoyed. But anyway, so that's my take on that. Um, the next thing, though, I wanted to look at is, uh, Kevin, I wanted to talk about what we're looking forward to in the next couple months, yeah. because right now we definitely are in kind of like a dead zone of film releases. Right. We're, we're and, in that lull after summer movies, but before yeah. award season movies where, you know, yeah, not, like, not, with the chance of Meatballs 2 is what comes out. So Yeah, it's or there was, a, right there was a One Direction movie and I think a Tyler Perry movie, and I just looked at the list of the... The what's playing at the multiplex, and I was just like, no, and no, and isn't there another rock concert movie? Uh, uh, I think they're they're probably oh, there's, there's a Metallica one that's yeah, that's up. the one I'm thinking of. Yeah, mm, yeah. yeah, no. Uh, so oh yeah, so so yeah, so because of that, this is a good time for us to <laughs> stop uh, and reflect. To 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 look at um at what is upcoming as opposed to what's <laughs> out right now. Um, Instead of what's downcoming. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. Bill, why don't you kind of jump in and, and of this list we've come up with, you maybe pick a couple that you want to talk about. There, there's oh. one. I will add. There's one on this list that I'm very excited for, and I'm I'm curious to see if you can figure out which one it is. I think I know which one it is. Okay. Is it the Book Thief? Um, I, I I am into, I'm I'm looking forward to the Book Thief. Yes, because it's it's a John Williams score. That's not the one I'm referring to though. So of all the and, and we'll kind of go through our list here of the twelve or, or however many films we have listed, the score that I'm most looking forward to um, upcoming, which I don't think it's been released in some film festivals. I don't think it has a wide release until next year. Is um, a, a documentary called Tim's Vermeer. That was going to be my next guess. Yeah, uh, it's it's directed by it's produced and directed by um, Penn and Teller. One of them is a producer. One of them is the, the director. I think, um, I think Teller is the director. I don't, I don't remember. But it feeds, it, it's a documentary about a guy who sought to basically um, recreate a Vermeer painting uh, mechanically. So finding some contraption that would basically forge a Vermeer. Uh, and it's supposed to be really good. But it's got uh, a score by Conrad Pope, who is uh, a, a, a person we've talked about before. Widely known as a Hollywood orchestrator, currently, um, if you follow Conrad on your on Facebook, you'll you'll know that he's uh, has been down in New Zealand working on uh, the Hobbit second Hobbit movie because he's an orchestrator on that. Um, but in the past, when we've talked about his scores, and he's a really great composer too, and it's I wish we could talk about him being a composer more, um, but he just for whatever reason doesn't get the composing gigs that he probably should. I think. Um, so it's, to me, it sounds like a really interesting film, um, that I know has been doing really well in festivals. And so with a Conrad Pope score on top of it, that's, that's one I'm, I'm really excited for. Um, it's going to be tough to find. And I actually, I don't, I haven't found yet whether or not, um, they are producing an actual soundtrack to release. I hope they do, but I don't know. Well, I was just going to say, thank you, Dave, because why don't we just run through the list real fast? Sure. Kind of come back and and you know do play by play. So we're collectively looking forward to. Feel free to add more to this list if you see one that should be here that's not included. But Thor: okay. The Dark World by Brian Tyler, and then The Hunger Games, uh, which is the Catch, catching, catching Fire, something, Catching Fire, Catching Something Fire. Yeah. Okay. So uh, also James Newton Howard, um, as in the first one. Uh, John Williams will score The Book Thief, mm-hmm. the, the Hobbit Two, otherwise known as The Hobbit Colon. The Desolation of Smaug. There you go. Well done. Okay, by Howard Shore. The Fifth Estate, which coincidentally will also have Benedict Cumberbatch. Yep. Uh, by Carter Burwell. Captain Phillips, to be scored by Henry Jackman. Frozen, which is the Disney movie, which will be scored by Christoph Beck. Tim's Vermeer, scored by Conrad Pope. And then finally, last but not least, Ender's Game, which will be scored by Steve Jablonski. So this is actually quite a, a pretty good assortment because all these look like they're fairly significant, well-funded studio films, um, m- maybe with the exception of Tim's Ver- Vermeer, but that's got your 
your yeah. sort of validation, your stamp of approval on it. So we'll yeah, I think to, it'll be good. I'm looking forward to well, it. Well, Penn and Teller, I mean, Penn and Teller are, are, I'd say, a fairly household name sure. at this point. So, um, yeah, I, I, if I could just kind of quickly go through, um, I definitely want to hear, you know, the book thief. I, you know, I, I, you know, grew up with John Williams. And I just, I always want to hear what he's got coming out next. Yeah. Um, the hunger games mixture. I did eventually rent the movie and it was entertaining, but I had all these sort of film making issues with it, I guess. But, um, but well, Newton Howard, you know, we'll see how much, um, We'll see how much Steve Reich they license for this one too. Well, that yeah, that was part of it. Um, but James Newton Howard can he can score any style, so you know he's he's fine. He'll probably bring back some themes. Uh, Thor, I'm looking forward to what Brian Tyler can bring. I'll keep my fingers crossed that it will be sort of appropriate and also memorable. And it looks like the film's going to be a little more epic than the first one. At least I hope. So maybe the score can do that. Um, uh, Captain Phillips and Fifth Estate, the two dramas, I don't really know. Uh, um, I mean, I don't, I don't have a lot of expectations for them. Uh, the Desolation of Smaug, I feel so weird saying it with that pronunciation. That's how you got to say it. It's... Mm, okay, anyway, The Hobbit 2, I'm, like <laughs> I'm looking forward to what Howard Shore is going to say uh, musically. And it seemed like, what, would you have guessed in the most recent trailer, Kevin, that came out this past Tuesday that that was new? Howard Shore music? Do you, uh, think? I, you know, I don't know. I only watched the trailer once, and and it's oh, it's worth the second viewing. Yeah, I'm I'm sure it is. I the, the thought really hadn't crossed my mind. I, I think I'd have to hear it a couple more times. Okay. Um, knowing knowing where they are, because I think they're like in the middle of recording that music right now. So I'm not sure if any of it had been done early enough to put it in the trailer. It's possible. I don't know. Okay. Well, and just to, for me to finish out my little quick rant here, uh, maybe. Maybe the last one I'd, I'd be interested in might be Ender's Game. Um, I mean, it's a big visual movie, a lot of special effects. And let's face it, a movie that has outer space, spaceships, special effects, and Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford. Can't be too bad. I mean, it's also got Gandhi or the Mandarin. By however name you know him, it's Ben Kingsley. Anyway, um, so it might, be, you know, it might be one to look out for as well. And I don't know the book series, honestly, but um, it, it comes with a lot of recommendations from our producer. So. So there's that. What, what are you looking forward to, Kevin? Uh, like you said, Tim's Ramirez, I think, is a big one. Of, of course, I'm looking forward to uh, John Williams' The Book Thief, um, The Hobbit, of course. I think um, another one that I'm kind of sort of keeping an eye out for is the Henry Jackman score to Captain Phillips. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know Henry Jackman's entire body of work super well, um, yeah. but just from, just from the things that I can recollect, I feel like this is maybe the first – big serious drama film that he's he's done i mean he did you know the wolverine and some other big like actiony type of movies not many of which i can remember being fantastic well well hang on uh he did x-men first class but the marco beltrami did the wolverine oh okay so right I'm, i've got the wrong the wrong x-men movie then but he did puss in boots and that was really that was really clever, yeah. fun, and, and cute. So, so this, this kind of seems like, again, just from those that I can kind of think of off the top of my head, accurately or not, um, it seems like maybe like the first kind of grown-up kind of thing. Um, so I'm, I am mean, it's a big Tom Hanks movie where Tom Hanks is probably trying to win an Oscar. Um, again. Again. So uh, playing, I'm curious Playing a gruff see, but likable character. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious to see how Henry Jackman does stepping up to this particular plate. I think I think that'll be a good one to keep an eye out for, as well. Yeah. Um, so mo- most of these are coming out in the relatively near future, with the um, the exception maybe Tim's Vermeer. Like I said, I don't think that one you're not going to be able to see until after the new year. The rest of these are all happening either in the fall or some of them are, are, are like you know Christmas movies. I think The Hobbit will be closer to Christmas. Um, but yeah, I, I think this is a good list to, to keep an eye out for. Well, since you made a good point with Henry Jackman, I'll take the same approach and say with Christoph Beck, this may be the highest profile thing he's done. I mean, this is a Disney movie. It's Frozen. It's, I think, the Ice Queen, I think, the Russian fairy tale. Okay. Snow Snow Queen. Okay. Sorry. I'm out. I didn't do a doctorate in fairy tales. I can't remember which one. But it's whichever one they haven't done yet (laughs) at Disney. So um, 
Anyone who has anything to do with music in a Disney film has got their hands full, whether it's come up with original songs or lyrics or a score. But either way, this is a high-profile gig for him, and maybe he, you know, maybe he hits a home run. And if anything, it's going to be high-profile, so if it's noticeable by more than a few people, he could get a nomination of Best Musical Score. I mean, how many times, I mean, how many movies has Alan Minken scored to compare him to the best film composers? And when you look at that, it's like not that many, but yeah, then true. how many Oscars has he won? And he's won a lot more than Jerry Goldsmith, who scored yeah. a lot more movies and yeah. written a lot better scores. But anyway, that's just – those opinions are not reflected by the show Sound Notion. Those are only the views <laughs> expressed by its co-host. Anyway, And um, down from Soapbox. Okay. <laughs> anyway, but, but you know, congrats to these uh, composers with their upcoming gigs, and let's see what they turn out. It should be cool. And, yeah, I'll, I'll pay attention. The, the Henry Jackman stuff, you're right, has been very kind of like popular movies. Puss yes. in Boots, X-Men. Um, i trying to think. Uh, he's got the Captain America, I think, coming out, the Winter Soldier, the Captain yep. America sequel. Yep. So this is very much, yeah, in a different vein. Yep. So it's just a little more – a little more of a grown-up project, I think. So it'll be interesting. Yes, yes. Okay. Well, that will do it for this episode of Streamers and Punches. You can listen to us uh, in Sound Notion at our website, soundnotion.tv slash SAP, uh, where you can subscribe our show, subscribe to the show, rather, uh, leave comments and or find links to the music we spoke about. Uh, you can also subscribe to the show through iTunes. So my name is Bill Witham. And I'm Kevin Will. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. Happy 50 episodes. Happy 50, yay. <laughs>